for this evening's program. We have, as you can see on the screen, Brett Dakin. He's there. Hi, Brett. Nice to Hi. meet you again. Yes, Brett and I were chatting a lot before the program started. Anyway, he is the uh, great nephew of Lev Fleeson, and he wrote a book about his great uncle, and it's called The American Daredevil, Comics, Communism, and the Battles of Lev Gleason. And Lev was a former resident of Chappaqua who lived here in 1940 to 1950. And was he the founder of the Newcastle News? Absolutely. Oh, I can't wait to hear the stories. And I can't wait to hear how he battles with Dewey Clint, Dewey um, Wallace, because, you know, that's the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center. So <laughs> thank you for coming and thank you for doing the Zoom program. So uh, please welcome Brett Dakin. Thanks, Joan. It's great to be here. And I, I only wish that we could all be together in person at the Chappaqua Library. Uh, I, I know that we will uh, be taking questions. If you have questions, you can put them in the, the chat box, I believe. And Joan oh, will be able to, to read them uh, <laughs> to me and, uh, and I'll respond if I can, I'll, tr I'll try my best. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll talk for a half hour or so and then we'll leave time for questions. Right, I did forget to say that and I told you I probably would. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so the only downside is that I can't see all of your lovely faces, but I'm very pleased that so many of you have chosen to join us tonight, given all the craziness that's going on in the world. And I only wish that we could be together in person at the amazing Chappaqua Library, where I did quite a lot of research for this book. And I, I remember very well getting on the Metro North Grand Central and going out to Chappaqua, walking to the library and asking to see old copies of the Newcastle News. And they had them all. So I was able to read them. And one of the first things I saw when I was going through the newspapers was the following image. So this is quite shocking. This is the headquarters of the Newcastle News, Halloween 1945. Germany had just surrendered. Japan was surrendered in September. The United Nations had just been formed. And uh, a few days before, the Newcastle News was founded. Uh, <clears throat> but as you can see, uh, it was defaced with graffiti along the lines that you see in front of you. and there was a very strongly worded editorial in that issue of the Newcastle News, and it was titled The Rotten Apple. Uh, and I'd like to just read uh, a little bit of the text for you. This is what the editorial says. It is sad and sickening and frightening to know that here in our town, we can experience vandalism and crude slander as base and sly as the Hitlerian pattern. But that is what has happened hidden under the cloak of a festive occasion preceding All Saints Day Halloween. To many of our readers, this will come as a deep shock, but the Newcastle News is by no means the only victim of such an outrage. It is our certain belief that the people in this town represent as fine a cross-section of America's best citizenry as can be found. There are among us a few who have fallen victim to the evil doctrines of the hate mongers the bigots and the betrayers of our country. They are the rotten apple in the barrel. What can our returning servicemen think to return here and find the manifestation of fascism in their own hometown? Let every citizen of goodwill and every organization stand guardedly alert to smother at once every slur on another citizen's origin, religion, or color. This is the real Americanism the other is the pattern of our enemy. So who was behind this editorial and this newspaper? Well, it was this man, Lev Gleason, who, as Joan said, was my great uncle, uh, Leverett Stone Gleason. And he moved to Chappaqua in 1944, just before founding the Newcastle News 
And he showed him up in Chappaqua, Lev, as I'll refer to him, or Uncle, was best known as a comic book publisher. And you can see right there in front of you, that's Uncle Lev standing in his offices on East 32nd Street in Manhattan with some of his characters on the wall behind him. His characters included Silver Streak, Captain Battle, <laughs> and of course, the sensational Daredevil. He was very successful in comic books. Part of the reason why he and his wife, Peggy, moved to Chappaqua was that they had made a bit of money and they were able to move out of their very small apartment in the village and move out to the suburbs. So what brought Uncle Lev to that point in his life? I just want to go over his life to that point uh, just to give you a sense of where he came from. He was born in 1898 in Winchenden, Massachusetts, uh, to a, a prominent family doctor, and he had a very comfortable existence. Uh, you can see here a very cute picture of Lev, a boy, uh, as a young child. Uh, here we have Lev, not so cute, uh, but this is him as a freshman at Harvard. He joined Harvard and was a member of the class of 1920, but he dropped out after only a year and he fought in World War I in France. Uh, he was eager to fight um, and chose to fight and never graduated from college. After the end of the war, he stuck around in Paris. And here is this great photograph of him in the Tuileries Gardens. Um, he remained in Paris studying at the Sorbonne, part of what was called the American Students Detachment, which was a special course created for American servicemen after the end of the war to study an extraordinary program, which I learned a lot about when I actually was in Paris and did some research for the book uh, and discovered a program that I never knew existed. But this is Uncle Lev in Tuileries Gardens. The caption for this photograph he wrote on the back was, who's the best looking, the statue or me? Which gives you a sense of uh, the healthy ego that Uncle Lev had. But he, the other interesting thing about this period in Paris was, it was also the time when Woodrow Wilson proposed the League of Nations and Wilson actually did visit Paris to speak to students at the Sorbonne at the time when Lev was there. Not sure he actually heard him speak, but I do know that he was a big believer in first the League of Nations, which as we know failed, but then in the United Nations. He returned to the States, uh, moved to New York, and that catches up to where we began, which is he got into comic books. He was there really at the birth of comic books, uh, which is not a story I'm gonna focus on tonight, Obviously, if a focus of the book, uh, comic books were born in New York City in the 1930s, and Uncle Lev was right there. He was part of the team that created uh, what we know today as comic book. But this issue here, I think, is interesting to pause on. This is July 1941, Daredevil battles Hitler. And you can see that while this is a superhero comic, and you've got Daredevil right there, He's fighting a real life enemy. And that's a photograph of Hitler superimposed on a comic. And it gives you a sense of Uncle Lev's politics. It was really the 30s when he became a very strong anti-fascist fighting against fascism in Europe and in the United States. And he was determined that the United States should enter into the war and fight Hitler and this comic book was conveying that message to his readers. Uh, and then he himself re-enlisted in the US Army and served on the home front in 1942. So that is essentially where he was in his life when he moved to Chappaqua along with his wife, Peggy. And my first memories of Chappaqua, and remember, I never met Uncle Lev. He died before I was born. He died in 1971, 
and I was born in 1976. So one of my great regrets in life is that I never met this extraordinary man. Um, but growing up, I did hear stories about him from my mom. That's my mom in Chappaqua at their home. They lived at 73 Park Drive from 1944 until they left in 1945. There's my mom with their standard poodle, Toto. And growing up, I would hear stories from my mom about her visits to Chappaqua, a place in her memory of extraordinary luxury and excitement. She lived in the suburbs of Boston. Uncle Lev was her flashy uncle from New York City. And she recalls well his house in Chappaqua, the meals they would have at places like La Cremaillere, which here's an ad from the Newcastle News back in the 40s. Um, it's still around. <laughs> it's still around. And in fact, uh, my husband and I went, ate there recently with my parents and had a wonderful meal. And my mom was able to reminisce about eating there with Uncle Lev. He was a very, he was very interested in food, in clothing, in style, in literature, and the arts. And he exposed my mom uh, to a whole new world. Uh, and so that was what I, that's basically what I knew. But I, upon investigating it more, I realized that he also was part of a group of folks in Chappaqua who were very politically active and like into publishing literature. Here you have Lillian Hellman and Dashiell Hammett who were nearby residents and very close friends of Uncle Lev and Aunt Peggy during their days in Chappaqua. Right, I think they lived on, um, not far from where your uncle, great uncle lived. They lived, I think, on Hard Scrabble Road in Chappaqua. I think you're right. Yeah, I've been to the house. Oh, wonderful. And so they were very close friends. They were the closest friends that Lev and Peggy had were the Rosenthal's, Mort and Roz Rosenthal, one of the few Jewish families in town at the time and quite prominent. And here you see them in Havana, New Year's Eve, 1947. They took a trip to Cuba and they stayed at the Hotel Nacional, which is still the grandest hotel in Havana. And doing quite well, I think, these days as Cuba sees a rebirth of sorts. But here they are celebrating New Year's Eve back in 1947. And you can see Uncle Lev sitting in the middle there at the back with the bow tie, uh, not wearing his glasses, which is very unusual for him, uh, but posing for this photograph. Now, all of these folks, Lev and Peggy, Dashiell Hammett, Lillian Hellman, and the Rosenthal's were of, they were like-minded when it came to politics. And they were very rare in Chappaqua in 1945. Chappaqua was a solidly Republican town with no Democratic representation, very few Jews, no temple, and a very conservative, inward-looking, uh, I would say. Uh, Lev, lost, okay. Sometimes when you move, you go out. Okay. I will, I'll, I'll stay like this. <laughs> uh, so Uncle Lev came to town and he set out to change Chappaqua very explicitly. And here you have the statement of policy from the very first issue of the Newcastle News on November 1st, 1945. The slogan was, let us not say it can't be done, let's do it, which says a lot about Uncle Lev's approach to life in general. He was action-oriented, always on the move. But in this statement of policy, you get a sense of what his purpose was here. 
it says, for example, a newspaper is per se a political instrument. The Newcastle News is independent, believing that no party has a monopoly on virtue or ability. In principle, we adhere to the Americanism, the ideas and the ideals of Thomas Jefferson, Lincoln, and our late beloved president, FDR. The era of atomic energy does not permit the luxuries of narrow prejudice, isolationism, be it on a national or local scale, or any remnants of Hitlerian hatred. And you see here that uh, he was a big believer in multilateralism, the United Nations, international engagement, and the Democratic Party. He was uh, in love with FDR and a big supporter of FDR uh, until, until the end of his life, really. Um, the, the thing is that there already was a newspaper in Chappaqua at the time, and that was called the Newcastle Tribune, uh, published in Mount Kisco. And over the course of the next six years, the life of the Newcastle News, the rivalry between these two papers was very strong. And in fact, the Newcastle Tribune developed, I would say, almost an obsession with Lev Gleason covering almost his every move. But I'll get to that in a second. In terms of what the Newcastle News actually focused on in its articles and editorials, there were issues like, for example, the United Nations. I have no idea, but in March 1946, residents of Newcastle were debating a proposal to construct the headquarters of the United Nations in Westchester. So there was a proposal to build it uh, right near Chappaqua. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of blowback. Uh, and in fact, there was an anonymous handbill distributed to people's houses around Chappaqua with the statement, the greatest evil of all is the fact that our government should be willing to give away or even sell American soil to foreign powers, the land that our boys fought to save. Well, Uncle Lev vehemently disagreed with that sentiment. And in this editorial here, you'll see that he is a big proponent of the United Nations, and why not put it in Westchester? Uh, that, as we know, didn't happen. Down, further down the page, you see Congressman Gamble's Week. So this was a weekly feature that was dedicated to the Republican congressman of the time, Ralph Gamble, reporting on his activities in Washington. And essentially, the point of these was to show that he wasn't doing much. And you can see there are common phrases like, he took no part in the debate when reporting on Congressman Gamble's activities representing Chappaqua and the surrounding areas in Washington. So that's an example of issues that the Newcastle News focused on. As I say, Uncle Lev was a big supporter of FDR and Harry Truman as well. And here we see a letter from Harry Truman to Lev Gleason saying, thanks very much for sending me a copy of the paper. I read the editorial with a lot of interest and appreciate it highly. And indeed, a lot of ink was used by the Newcastle News and Lev and his team on supporting Harry Truman's efforts to expand the New Deal, expand progressive domestic legislation uh, for example, full employment, increasing the minimum wage, extending price control legislation beyond the end of the war, and also the plight of returning veterans, because Uncle Lev, of course, was a vet himself, and so he spent a lot of time pushing for taking care of World War II vets. Uh, the Newcastle Tribune, on the other hand, disagreed with all of that, and the local Republican establishment was very, very skeptical of all of those initiatives. And so there was a lot of back and forth. Now, of course, 
the newspaper also focused on just basic local events. Like here you go, there's an article about big okay. Yes, big plans afoot for the strawberry festival event organized. We still have it. Oh, is that right? Wow. Yes. So this is, uh, yes, this was organized by the Women's Guild Auxiliary of the St. Mary's Episcopal Church, who will stress food, fun, and a general good time for young and old. Uh, so there were local issues. This one I just had to point out for, for Joan's benefit because there was a controversy at the time over the library. So here you oh. see an editorial uh, in the Newcastle News talking about how the library is so popular and doing so well in terms of serving its readers that it's run out of space. And the librarian, Mrs. Margaret Handley, is desperate to build a new wing. And again, the local political establishment was not interested. And so she was really struggling to get the funds allocated. Uh, but here you have Uncle Lev supporting her, quote, intrepid, unheeded, solitary plea for an, a building addition to house the overflow. So right. Joan was telling me that the library is, is being renovated as we, as we speak. Is that right? right? Right, but um, I remember the librarian after that was Alice Graflin, with the, uh, um, the, one of the elementary schools and named after her. And again, she did the exact same thing as Margaret Handley. So and we kept on going through all the uh, directors and then we moved from what's present from Center Street, which is now the community center, to our new location on um, South Greeley Avenue. Wow. And now we're building and enlarging it. This is our second renovation. Uh, I can't wait to see it. So as, as I was saying before, all this while through the, the late 40s, the Newcastle Tribune, the other paper, became really obsessed with Uncle Lev and would report on reports of his activities. For example, here you have an entire article dedicated to the fact that Uncle Lev was the guest at a dinner for Congressman Mark Antonio, who represented Harlem and was an American Labor Party representative, uh, holding a fundraiser at the Hotel Commodore. Uh, the sponsors included W.E.B. Du Bois, Howard Fast, uh, and Rockwell Kent. And Dashiell Hammett, who we mentioned before, was part of uh, a committee formed to support Mark Antonio. So here you get a hint of why was the Newcastle Tribune so interested in Uncle Lev and his activities? And it was back to what I mentioned before because of his politics and his very explicit moves to change the political makeup of Chappaqua and the surrounding communities. The next one, the next example of this really took me aback when I was sitting in the Chappaqua Library. I found this article, and remember, I was just leafing through these old issues. I didn't know what I was going to. Here you have uh, this big headline, accuses game warden of racial bias in arresting Jap. And of course, we would never use that term today, uh, but at the time, Jap was a common uh, term to refer to Japanese and Japanese Americans. Well, who is accusing the game warden of racial bias? None other than Leverett Gleason. And this, it turns out that, as the article said, this Japanese couple, Mr. and Mrs. Mishi, is what the article says, were reported fishing in Chappaqua. They will fish no more not until they straighten out their fishing licenses anyway, and explain why they declared they were American citizens when Mr. Mishi was actually born in Japan and neither had been in New York State six months, the required time for a fishing license here. Well, 
it turns out that Uncle Lev showed up to help these people out. And in doing so, he, quote, shook his finger at the young game warden angrily and told him that he would not have been so particular about arresting this couple if they had not been Japs. So who were these people? Well, it turns out these two Japanese folks, one was Japanese from Japan, one was Japanese American, born in the States. They worked for Uncle Lev and they were part of Uncle Lev's household help. Uh, he had a driver and he had a cook and this couple worked for the Gleasons at 73 Park Drive for the years they lived there. It took a little sleuthing to figure this out. I had to leave the Chappaqua Library and go over to the town hall and ask to pull police records from this period. And incredibly enough, I found them and I figured out who these people were. Their, their name was actually Nishi with an N like Nancy, not Nishi. So the Newcastle Tribune got the name wrong, but the incident is, did indeed happen. So that's an example of the Newcastle Tribune really following what otherwise seemed like rather mundane incidents in Uncle Lev's life. Um, I also want to point out that you can see there the, that the, the Jewish temple holds its first service uh, during this period. Now, this really all came to a head with the following headline, blasted on the Newcastle Tribune's front page, July 4th, 1947, Leverett Gleason found guilty. And look at that photograph. I mean, Uncle Lev at his most brash, very loud tie, his standard glasses, and a smirk on his face that's really ready to be wiped away. So how is it that Lev Gleason, who loved his country, served in the US Army twice, was now being accused and in fact found guilty of a crime by his own government? Well, the story really begins back in the 1930s during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, Spanish Civil War, a fight between Republicans, not our kind of Republicans, but Republicans fighting for the Republic of Spain versus Franco and his fascist forces, there were refugees who came out of that. And refugees on the Republican side needed help. So a group called the Joint Anti-Fascist Refugee Committee was formed, and it raised money in the States to support these refugees. And this became a bit of a cause celeb. Here you have Pablo Picasso, who was a big supporter, but folks like Ernest Hemingway, Eleanor Roosevelt, Lucille Ball, Leonard Bernstein, Groucho Marx, Rita Hayworth, all these people signed on and were big supporters. And Uncle Lev was a member of the board of directors. So he was very involved in supporting this organization uh, and the thing is that after the end of the war, this organization was named a communist front organization by the Department of Justice. And this we get into now, what really ensnared Uncle Lev in the late 40s, which was before McCarthy ever showed up, the first sort of iteration of anti-communism and the Red Scare in the States. And it was a cooperation between the Department of Justice, the FBI, and Republicans and Southern Democrats in Congress. And this guy here is Democrat John Rankin of Mississippi, Mississippi, who was the one who really established the House Un-American Activities Committee as a permanent committee of the House of Representatives. This guy was an adamant segregationist. He proposed bills to prohibit interracial marriage. He opposed the creation of the UN. And he is the one who really directed the House Un-American Activities Committee to focus exclusively on communism and alleged communists. He dissuaded the committee from investigating white supremacists. 
and the KKK. In fact, he was a big supporter. So this committee investigated Uncle Lev's group, the Joint Anti-Fascist Refugee Committee, hauled the members of the board before the House, including Uncle Lev, and demanded that they reveal the names of all of their supporters and all of the refugee folks they were helping, all under the guise of an investigation of communism and the threat to the US government posed by this group that was really focused on something completely different, uh, helping Republican refugees out of Spain. Uh, so I went to National Archives and I read through the files and in the book I talk a lot more about this incredible battle that happened after the Congress decided to cite the board for contempt of Congress. Uh, they went to trial. You can see here the Newcastle Tribune is reporting on the fact that Lev testified at trial uh, and ultimately they lost and all of the board members were convicted of contempt of Congress for failing to name names, including Uncle Lev. So it's, it's fascinating to me that this man who was a clear supporter of the US government and really felt like American democracy was, despite all its flaws, the best solution to the problems of the United States and uh, other parts of the world would be uh, deemed an enemy of the state. But that is what happened to Uncle Lev. And this here, I wanted to show this piece, which gives you a sense of the kind of hysteria that was already uh, ramping up in Chappaqua itself uh, in 1947. Here we have a, an article about a priest, Reverend John Flynn, pastor of the St. Patrick's Church in nearby Bedford, who announced that the country was under threat from an enemy within our very borders. And he warned of an attack against the soul of our government to weaken it and ultimately destroy it. And that's what Uncle Lev was being accused of doing. Uh, so Uncle Lev fought back. I love this quote here, which he, which is from an editorial, which of course he published in reaction to his conviction of contempt. And he states very clearly, we are in a period of reactionary swing in this country, a very dangerous swing, holds many of the elements of potential fascism. And I'm not going to get into it too much, but I do think that that quote has resonance today. Now, I see that it's 740. So we I can think go a little longer. I've, okay, I have, I have sort of a couple more uh, anecdotes to go through. And I do want to get to this man, but Wallace, who, as Joan mentioned, was the publisher of Reader's Digest. Now, just to give you a sense of how Uncle Lev was always ready for a fight, despite the fact that he had just been convicted, condemned of Congress, he ran headlong and into a fight with DeWitt Wallace in Chappaqua. So as, you, as everyone knows, the Reader's Digest, a beloved magazine, gathered jet, jet interest articles together from other publications them and published them in a pocket-sized format. It had, and I read it as a kid, I remember very well my grandfather gave me a subscription to the Reader's Digest, and I very much enjoyed reading it. But what I didn't realize at the time was that at least during this period we're talking about, the Reader's Digest had a very conservative editorial approach. Traditional values for the free market, traditional marriage, against feminism, affirmative action, and any kind of anti-authoritarian dissent. It was also the largest employer in town. And of course, the Wallace family were great, became great philanthropists and were beloved uh, by the members of the community. And still today, we hear about the, the great stuff that the Wallace Foundation does, not just in Chappaqua, but around the country. But Wallace would have been aware of Uncle Lev because this is one of 
Uncle Lev's many non-comics publications and newspaper either. This was a magazine called Reader's Scope. And it was a clear attempt to imitate Reader's Digest, but with a left-leaning perspective. Same format, same size, same approach, which was take articles from other publications and put them together in a digest format, but with a totally different editorial bent. It, would, it included articles blasting white supremacy and celebrating, for example, the history of the 54th Regiment, Massachusetts Voluntary Infantry, the first black regiment organized during the Civil War. Uh, so the way in which Uncle Lev and DeWitt Wallace, their paths intersected is in February 1950, when McCarthy came along. Bill well, McCarthy, as we all know, gave a famous speech uh, in February 1950, where he held up a bunch of papers and said, I have, I have in my hand a list of communists in the State Department, uh, and they're a threat to our country and all the rest of it. Now, we know now that there was, that was basically an empty piece of paper. There was no list of people. Uncle Lev had his suspicions. He published an op, they published an editorial in the Newcastle News blasting McCarthy and reminding people that McCarthy himself uh, had very strong links to uh, anti-Semitism and was essentially an anti-Semite himself. And in doing so, he quoted uh, another publication called In Fact, which was dedicated to stamping out domestic fascism and supporters of fascism in the US government and in business. Well, DeWitt Wallace immediately fired off a letter to Uncle Lev and said, because you published that editorial and you quoted this publication, in fact, I am canceling all of my advertising with the Newcastle News. And I can imagine why, because DeWitt Wallace would have been familiar with the claims made in, in fact about him, which were that he had supported Hitler before the war uh, and had allegedly said to his staff, you know, we also need a little fascism in the United States to keep this country in order. Now, DeWitt Wallace, I'm not sure whether he ever actually refuted those claims, but he uh, dismissed the publisher of those claims as, of course, a communist and demanded that uh, Uncle Lev retract his editorial based on those, uh, based on that other publication. And Uncle Lev fired back and said that he was uh, that DeWitt Wallace was launching an attack on freedom of speech. That was a weak argument because, of course, Wallace was free to withdraw his advertising where, however he pleased. But as you can see here, this was great fodder for the Newcastle Tribune, which reported on this dispute. And the dispute also made the national press, by the way, even appearing in uh, magazines like Newsweek uh, because it involved DeWitt Wallace and Uncle Lev by that point had become quite a prominent figure himself. So we're coming to the end of the story here because in September 1951, the Newcastle News folded. Uncle Lev made a decision to suspend publication after six years in print. Uh, essentially, he didn't have the money to support it. It wasn't the advertising revenue, uh, perhaps the town couldn't support two papers uh, anymore. Um, but whatever the reason, he decided to suspend publication. And in this very long editorial, you can see here, he makes some statements about how he thinks that he did some good. And, and he points out some big differences between Chappaqua in 1945, when he showed up, and 1951, when he's suspending publication. Uh, for example, the, as I mentioned before, the first local Jewish temple had been founded in 1949. Uh, a new school that had been in, uh, endorsed by the news had been constructed over vociferous objections. And by 1951, it was already filled to capacity 
and confronting the possibility of another expansion. The town, of course, remained conservative and still no Democrat had been elected, but Republicans were no longer the only option. And he says in this editorial, perhaps the greatest contribution the news has been able to make in this community has been its support in the building of the Democratic Party. And in 1951, for the first time in a very long time, the Democrats actually filed a full slate of candidates, candidates for local office. So the newspaper folded, but he claimed credit for a lot of changes. The Newcastle Tribune, this is all I had to say about it. Newcastle News suspends, lost $75,000 in six years. So they, they were gonna miss Uncle Lev because they provided a lot of fodder for their readers. Um, but they didn't have many nice things to say about him uh, on his way out. Uh, so Uncle Lev, after the end of this newspaper, he had another fight, another battle to fight, which I'm not going to go into tonight, but which book uh, is, a good portion of the book is dedicated to. That was a battle on the comics front. His most successful title at that time was Crime Does Not Pay. And as you can see here, it could get pretty gruesome. And in the mid-1950s, a man named Dr. Fred Wortham came along and wrote a book called The Seduction of the Innocent, essentially claiming that comic books like Uncle Lev's were causing juvenile crime. And Uncle Lev dedicated uh, the rest of his career as a comic book publisher to fighting back against this Answer comic books. My book chronicles what happened ultimately. In 1955, this is what Uncle Lev would have looked like at that time. He and Aunt Peggy left Chappaqua, and a lot of people didn't know where they went. They kind of disappeared uh, after having been a very public figure. Uh, he disappeared from the papers, he shut down his company, didn't publish any more comic books or magazines or newspapers. He basically disappeared from And in the book, I, I investigate and determine what happened to him. But I want to end this talk here uh, because this is when his time in Chappaqua came to an end. And I'll just end by saying, I need a drink. And I'm going to take a sip here, but I think um, this has been a great pleasure for me. The book is out next week, uh, officially, and you can find it uh, online uh, or in your local bookstore. And I know that the wonderful local bookstore, Chappaqua. Chap uh, scattered books. Scattered Books uh, will have the book, and I was in touch with them earlier today, and they said, tell people to check out the website or email them at info at scatteredbooks.com. The book will also be available uh, at your favorite online retailer. Um, you can lear learn more at my website, brettdakin.com, where you can read more about Uncle Lev uh, and figure out how to media. Uh, and order and, and where to order the book. Uh, and I'm going to end there. And if there are any questions, Joan, let's see if we can uh, field them. Right. Um, I just want to mention before anyone else does, <clears throat> excuse me, I moved to Chappaqua in 1971, which is kind of interesting. And I remember um, uh, there was a local newspaper. I don't remember, because uh, Reporter Dispatch was there, but that was, that was uh, encompassed a, a few more towns than just Chappaqua. And then there was the Chappaqua Journal, which also folded. And uh, there were other newspapers around. But I wonder what your uncle would have thought of when President and Secretary Clinton moved into Chappaqua. I mean, this, has, this is definitely a political town and a political area. Governor Cuomo lives right on the outskirts of Newcastle. So this, this area is very politically active. He would have fit right in for sure. 
<laughs> and would have been very happy here in the in the northern climes of Westchester. Yes, he would have been very pleased to see what ultimately happened in Chapel Hill. Right, right. So if anyone has any questions, please go to your chat function, which is um, which has like a little uh, rectangle uh, above it, and you just have to click on it and type in your question. I didn't see any questions coming up during the talk, but we had quite a number of people here, so um, I didn't know. You were so thorough, people might not have any questions, and I'm not getting any questions, so um, that's, that's I'll fine. wait a few more mo moments, but um, you did a great job. I was fascinated, considering I lived here for so long, and I knew some of these. This <laughs> is like old home week here. I well, mean, thank you for... Russell, it, but, um, it's been great to to speak with you, and I, you know, as soon as we, my publisher and I started thinking about how to publicize the book and where to speak about it, I thought the Chappaqua Library got to do it because it was that's where I learned so much of what I just talked about was in in your library. So thank you for that. Oh, we did get a question. Who are the illustrator of your book? The illustrator of the cover of the book it just says who are the illustrators of the comic books oh like okay Dallas. well so in terms of uncle lev's comic books he you know really his genius was he knew how to hire the right team he was not an illustrator he was not a writer i don't think he was particularly creative himself but he hired a team of folks most importantly charlie biro and bob wood and he put them in charge and he put his name and their names on the cover of every issue of every comic book he ever published, which was very unique. And he elevated them to a position of authority and he gave them the latitude to hire writers and artists. And he also provided them with a profit sharing mechanism, which was very rare among comic book publishers because he wanted to create an incentive for people to do their best work and he wanted to treat people fairly. So the number of writers and artists who were employed or contracted by Lev Gleason Publications over the uh, almost 20 years uh, is probably impossible to calculate, um, but it's you know, in the hundreds. Oh, and we have another question from Jonathan. Any comments on folks losing their jobs these days for political reasons? For example, the president of Mozilla and Firefox? Well, I, I have no comment on that in particular because I'm not aware of that incident. But what I will say is this book took a long time to write and get to publication. But it seems to me that Lev's story has only become more relevant. Uh, and the, the, his politics, his determination that the U.S. be a full-fledged representative democracy where people are free and, and can enjoy the fruits of American life regardless of their color, religion, background, national origin, they are just as important today and maybe more than they have been in my lifetime. So that's the way to answer that question. I'd say my comment is this story is really resonant today. And that's too bad, but it does give us hope uh, that uh, the forces of good can prevail. All right, Jonathan replied. Oh, I just lost it. Jonathan replied by saying um, the president of Firefox was fired after he gave money to support an anti-gay marriage referendum in California. And I guess that he was fired, so I had no idea myself, so that's interesting. Just a, a fact. Well, anyway, I want to thank you so much. This thank is you. so informative, um, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And if, you, um, if your friends missed it, you could always tell them to go on our website because we record all our programs and we archive them on our website. So all you have to do is go to chappaqualibrary.org 
And as you scroll down on the right side, you will see where it says uh, libraries, lectures, and pro Lo Chappaqua Library lectures and programs. And you just click on what you would like to see. Thanks, so, John. Um, uh, Jonathan also said great presentation. So. <laughs> Jonathan, right. and thanks, Joan. And one last f image here. I know that if Uncle Lev were alive today, he would say, <laughs> wear your mask. As we all should. Absolutely. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, and thank you all for attending. Hope to see you at the art lecture this Friday. Bye-bye.